Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR Podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I'm really excited to be sitting down with Marcus Buckingham. Marcus is a best-selling author and the head of research for people and performance at the ADP Research Institute. Uh, he's a name many of you know who've been following the show, and we're going to get into Marcus's career, his thoughts on the evolving nature of the field of HR and people ops broadly, uh, as well as the new HR experience score metric that he and his team have recently released. So, Marcus, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, I know many viewers and listeners are familiar with you, but I'd love for you to just start off with an introduction on yourself. Hi, Lars. Um, I'm, uh, well, as you said, I'm uh, right now running the Research Institute here at the ADP Research Institute, which is focused on everything to do with kind of measuring things about the world of work that you can't count, but are nonetheless really important. And really, that's been my career, I suppose. 17 years with Gallup doing pretty much exactly that. How do you measure talent? How do you measure strengths? How do you measure employee engagement? How do you measure resilience? So did that for about 17 years, then left to build my own company and, and get all uh, involved in the entrepreneurial way of things. And then um, ADP came and basically said, look, we've got a research institute that focuses a lot on the labor market. Uh, we have, of course, the National Employment Report, but we'd like to add to that an awful lot of focus on, on humans at work and what can we really know about humans at work. And of course, I was tremendously excited by that opportunity. So. Uh, so that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. Well, you know, you have a really interesting background as it relates to HR because your your grandfather worked in this space, your father mm -hmm. worked in this space. Was it, you know, was it just inevitable that you would find yourself in this space as well? Like, did you think about pursuing other fields uh, before you joined Gallup? Walk me through that background. Well, yeah, my, my grandfather, uh, Wilfred Buckingham, uh, he was a... Uh, a tanker in the Second World War. And after the end of the Second World War, they gave various um, various folks the opportunity to go and learn a brand new craft and trade. And so he went to the London School of Economics and majored in personnel um, and got out and spent his entire career with British Airways. Actually, it was called British European Airways at the time um, as a director of HR. And then my dad did the same. Um, I don't know if they had a conversation about it or not, but anyway, he spent his entire career. Obviously, my grandfather was focused mostly on demobilization and reskilling an entire country. My dad was focused more on, on labor management disputes and collective bargaining agreements and everything that was going on in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, um, which I didn't actually find terribly <laughs> interesting around the, the, around the dinner, uh, dinner table, if I'm honest. But then I went, I was going up to university to study uh, French and Latin, of all things, because those are tremendously useful. It was called Modern and Medieval Languages. But right before I went up, my dad was, he was actually the human, he was the chief human resources officer for a company that had 7,000 pubs. And uh, a pub isn't really like a bar, it's more like a public house, which I guess is what it's short for. It's a public space in a community. And um, he was trying to figure out ways to hire better pub managers because the quality of the pub really isn't determined by the beer. I mean, we've all had English beer and it's, <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily that great or that different pub to pub. So the pub, the, the public space was really driven by the quality of the pub manager. And he was having a terribly difficult time finding really good pub managers for 7,000 pubs. Um, and he came across this chap called Donald Clifton, who was running uh, a company at the time called Selection Research Inc. out of Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, Don, uh, since obviously developed Strength Finder and became kind of the grandfather of positive psychology. But at the time, he basically was saying to my dad, look, we think we have a system that will help us measure what every great pub manager has in common and then build an instrument so that we can use that in pre-employment selection. And uh, my dad was riveted by this and brought Don over and the team over. And I met Don at 16 around my dinner table. And he said, what are you going up to study university? And I said, modern and medieval languages. And he said, yeah, what about uh, psychology or social psychology? And so we started to talk. And then over the first summer before I went up to university, he said, come over to Lincoln, Nebraska, come and learn about, about how do you measure 
characteristics, attributes in humans that they might not even know they have themselves, come and study that. And if you're interested, then you can come every summer thereafter and we'll see what happens. And so 1984, I went over to Lincoln, Nebraska and stayed for about seven or eight weeks that first time and was immediately just hooked. Um, the idea that you could actually figure out the right question and the right listen for and then code those things in a way that was methodologically sound so that you had inter-rater reliability of a bunch of different people coding the same response in the same way, and that you could actually do that and measure talents in people that they might not know that they had, and also that cut through differences of race or gender or age. So if you wanted to measure empathy, there was a question or a set of questions to do that, regardless of gender or race or socioeconomic uh, st status. So it was like, it was, in, for me, an incredibly invigorating subject that I just couldn't get out of my head all the way through university. So the moment I left uh, university, I guess my dad and I did have some conversations about what else I might do. But in my head, almost from that very first summer in 1984, I decided that I wanted to go and learn how do you, how do, you do what, what is really called psychometrics. How do you do yeah. that? Well, interesting. So you, as you mentioned, you kind of went to Gallup, you spent the first 17 years of your career there mm. before branching out on your own and kind of going the entrepreneurial route. I love origin stories. Like what, walk me through your thought process there. What, when did you know it was time to go out on your own? Uh, what was that transition period like for you? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I, I don't like change that much, frankly. I like continuity. So I liked the 17 years we had done so much, you know, we'd, we'd created Strength Finder, which had become this huge thing. I'd written two books by that stage, uh, First Break All the Rules and then Now Discover Your Strengths, which both, to my great surprise, had become incredibly popular. And, and so I was kind of enjoying the whole process and Gallup was moving sort of further and further away from pure polling and more and more into the, into the world of the measurement of humans at work. Um, but then I think two things happen. One is, as I've always written about, people leave managers, not companies. And, and Don tragically passed away. And he had always been my, I mean, London to Lincoln, Nebraska is a long leap. I had no friends over there. I didn't really know anything about the world I was moving into. It's the Midwest. It was, I had no understanding of that world at all. What kept me there all that time was Don. Um, he, was, he was a mentor. He was a genius. He was... The person that I felt if I could stay close to that person for my entire career, I would probably have a pretty valuable and useful career. And then he passed away and it kind of, you know, it just caused me to stop and think about what I was doing and why. And then the other part of it, I suppose, Lars, was that we were just a measurement company and measurement's great. And yes, measurement improves performance. And yes, as they say, what gets measured gets managed. So measurement's jolly important, but we didn't actually take action on what we were measuring. So we measured engagement, but we didn't really help companies build engagement. We measured people's strengths, but we didn't really help people to apply those strengths in the real world. So what I wanted to do was move more into that. And frankly, Gallup wasn't really that interested in doing that. So I thought, you know what? Well, I think now is probably a good time for me to go and figure out whether or not we could take what we're measuring and actually turn it into prescription or coaching or action um, so that we can not just uh, count, but we can actually improve the things that we're counting. That's, that's really what got me started. Yeah, now that that makes sense. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, uh, the first break all the rules, the book you published in 1999, mm. um, kind of examining manager effectiveness. And I'm curious, kind of if you if you look at the the landscape of work today, uh, compared with the landscape in that you were assessing and evaluating and writing about in 99, what looks different? What looks the same? Well, of course, technologically, everything's changed. Yeah. I mean, even the last two years, right? We've all become used to uh, communicating with one another, collaborating with one another, being creative with one another in a way that's really different than what it was certainly in 1999. Everything is at a remove. Everything is also faster. Everything is also more continuously on. 
So really the last 20 years has been a sort of a gradual increase in speed and a gradual decrease in barriers. <laughs> so it's like there's no on anymore, there's no off anymore, there's no home anymore, there's no work anymore, there's no pure friends and pure colleagues, everything's all kind of mushed together. And, and that's been accelerated through technology and then double accelerated, I suppose, through the pandemic that we've all been struggling through. Um, so now you, you've just got a, a much more uh, dynamic and confusing and sometimes confounding world where you really struggle, I think, in a way that perhaps wasn't true in 1999. You struggle for your identity. Where, where is your identity as a friend, as a, as a worker? Um, where does your identity come from when everything's all blurred and mushed up together? And where in the last two years, your routines have all gone. So yeah. the person that you saw in the office, you walked in and you waved at and you reminded yourself that you were this, they were that, that all that kind of anchoring has all gone away. <laughs> um, so the, the confusion on all of our parts, the complexity of the world has seemingly sort of turned up to 11. Um, that's what's changed. I mean, what hasn't changed are, are a few fundamentals. Uh, first of all, of course, if you, if you don't have a customer, you don't have a company. So that hasn't changed. I mean, you might have a, an enterprise that someone has funded, but until you have a customer, you don't have a company. You don't have the ability to grow that company. You don't have anyone you're serving. That, that has not changed. I doubt that will ever change. That doesn't mean you couldn't go get investment for some like, amazing idea of yours that doesn't have any customers yet. They were paying anything. We've all seen examples of that. But basically, that stays the same. Um, managers. I mean, what stays the same in terms of what humans need? Humans need individualized attention from a person who's bringing them the work. And in many, 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 many cases, that's the manager. And whether you call that person a supervisor, whether you call that person a, a team lead or a manager, we work so much better in response to another human being. We're so close to our own stuff. We don't necessarily see our own stuff. We aren't necessarily the ones that can coordinate a group of five or six or seven or eight people into a team that then can actually get more done together that they can ever do alone. Um, there, there is a wisdom to the way in which we work with a manager or team leader. That's clearly was true back in 1999, which is why I wrote the book, frankly, was to go kind of, it's the manager, stupid. And if we get that right, so many things go right. And if we get that wrong, really almost doesn't matter what you're trying to do everything's diminished. So, so the, the, the role of the manager back then was tremendously important. Today, uh, just as important, if not more so. Who's going to be the glue that pulls everyone together who are working remotely or hybridly or dynamically? Who's going to be the one that builds trust? Who's going to be the one that helps you figure out this week what your priorities might be versus next week? Who's going to be the one that runs interference for you so that you can actually get done what you need to get done? Um, that role's tremendously important. And we could chat more, maybe we will chat more about, about some of the, the companies that are flouting that truth that we work really, really well in small teams with great managers. I mean, that's really where humans thrive. When you push that aside, when you ignore that truth today, um, you run into all sorts of obstacles that, that we could chat more about. Yeah, look, I think you're right. And I think it, it's, it's, Magnified today, as you mentioned, as more companies are working uh, hybridly, remotely, dynamically in different ways, um, the importance of managers making those connections, supporting those employees. And I think that last part, supporting employees, is probably a, an element of, of management that maybe we haven't, uh, you know, we certainly haven't approached the way that we're approaching now as we talk about experiencing the global pandemic, having different conversations around mental health and supporting employees and workplace flexibility. Uh, you know, those are all very, the, the, the conversations we're having in those areas today are very different than they were even three years ago. And I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective. Like a lot of the, we've been talking about this, this notion of future of work for over a decade now. And I, I, we're, we're in that now. I kind of use that in past term, past tense, you know, what we once called the future of work uh, the field of HR specifically, I think, has been uh, pretty dramatically transformed over the last two years. And I think that trend will continue as we are, are centered in helping 
our businesses and our employees and our teams, you know, navigate through this period of the pandemic and beyond. So I'd love to get your perspective because I know you've been researching this field for, for decades. When you think of the evolution that HR has gone through, you know, had been going through even prior to the pandemic, but certainly has been accelerated over the last two years, where do you see this field continue to evolve over the next, you know, couple of years? Yeah, well, it's on... On some level, the role of HR should always be to support really good managers. I mean, let's just say that just just to begin with. We know that a tremendous um, power exists in your experience of your local team. And one of HR's jobs surely must be to support in any way they can think of supporting each team leader trying to build and manage and develop their team. When you get beyond spans of control of 1 to 10, when you get 1 to 15, 1 to 20, in some hospitals, 1 to 30, 1 to 50, one nurse supervisor to 50 nurses. In some warehouses, distribution centers, it gets up to 1 to 70 call centers. When we get, when we get spans of control like that, we lose the thing that human beings need at work. We need individualized attention. We absolutely need individualized attention the same way that our kids do. And when we build an environment in which one nurse supervisor has to manage 50 nurses, no wonder we have burnout. We had burnout before the pandemic. Today, how can one particular nurse supervisor know what that particular nurse is going through today? What she or he is feeling in terms of their family at home, in terms of their commute to work that day, in terms of dropping their kid off at school that day, in terms of something they might be struggling with from the previous day at work. All the stuff that you need to feel you can share with someone so you can be seen and therefore, in a way, share some of the challenges that you're experiencing. All of that can't happen, cannot happen, when the spans of control are 1 to 40, 1 to 50, 1 to 60. So any organization that's got, as an organizational premise, 1 to 40, 50, 60, is going to see higher levels of turnover, higher levels of mental ill health, higher levels of burnout, and we do. So one part of HR, surely moving forward, should be, what do humans need? What do all humans need? In a sense, dear CFO, it doesn't matter whether the numbers compute. I know you could run a, you could run a hospital on one to 60, one nurse supervisor to 60 nurses. You can for a short period of time in labor markets where the talent is plentiful. But if you've got a labor market like, I don't know, today, where talent is super tight and you've got, you can't find nurses at all, you can't run a business denying humans the individualized attention that they need. I know, dear CFO, you wish they didn't need that individualized attention, but they do. So for HR, you know, in my grandfather's time, HR was in a weird way. And to some extent, my father's time too, the role of HR was almost to protect the company from the employees. A lot of HR came up through compliance. A lot of HR came up through legal, as you know. And so there's a there's a holdover of that, of like, we are the HR function. We're here to make sure the employees don't do something really stupid and hurt the company. And I'm not saying that sometimes that shouldn't happen. But the role of HR has got to change. The fundamental mission of HR has got to be, how can we help this uh, company or organization deserve the best people? Why do we deserve the best people? We in HR have got to figure out, well, what is it that the best people need and desire? Not just money, but what do they need and desire from their experiences at work? What are those things? That one I just mentioned, individualized attention, is one of them. Well, therefore, in HR, we can't be party to building org structures that prohibit, actually almost physically prohibit, that kind of individualized attention. Well, you can, but then you won't deserve the best people. Why do most healthcare systems today struggle to get the nurses that they need? Because they don't deserve them. I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing. There are some amazing team leaders in some healthcare companies. But many healthcare organizations, even the, even the biggest, well, particularly the biggest, have designed a system so that the nurses don't get what they need. So HR, I see the role of HR as being the, the advocate for the individual needs of each human. A, for moral reasons, because that's the right thing to do. B, for business reasons, because if you don't do that, 
then you won't deserve the best people and you won't be able to find those people. And therefore your business will go into a tailspin because you don't have the talent. Well, we're sort of right there right now where all of us in HR sort of have to come together and go, well, what is our mission? I think, now of course this is just I think, but I think the mission should be, can we build organizations which take as their moral starting point the worth and the value and the potential of each human? Not to get too kind of woo-woo, but let's use that as our moral starting point and then all good things in business language will flow from that. Yeah, you know, I really, I, I like the way you frame that. And I think that it is uh, when you, especially when you look at kind of legacy HR teams and functions versus modern or progressive functions, the way they think, the way they approach that is much more aligned with with how you frame that. So I think that uh, it's interesting to see the alignment there. And I want to, you know, kind of segue into uh, a new metric and a new report that you recently uh, released on HR experience score. Uh, and it's a fascinating new way to kind of measure uh, and assess the, uh, you know, the, the impact uh, of HR teams. And before we get into kind of what makes up the, the HR uh, XPS, you mentioned kind of as it connects to the talent brand of the organization. I'd, I'd love to just start with kind of how you're defining talent brand uh, for those purposes, and then we can jump into uh, what makes up the metric. Yeah. Well, we, um, we began actually by just asking some questions about talent brand. So, so the most obvious question that you can get to with talent brand is, would you recommend this company or this organization as a place to work to friends and family? Um, this day and age, we want people to be charging around their communities, advocating that our place to work is awesome. Uh, however you slice and dice your particular ta uh, talent brand, the outcome of it is that you've got an awful lot of current employees advocating for your company as a place to work. So the question that we went into this with was what drives that? Like we, if, if CEOs and CHROs want to create a really good talent brand, of course they can build a great website, which talks about all the jolly good things that they do in the community or the jolly good things that they do for their employees. But the overall outcome of it isn't felt by what you put out on your website. It's felt by what somebody who actually works for you goes and says, to their friends and family and their community about your place to work. So our question then was what drives that? And as we dove into it, obviously some big chunk of that is actually 51% of the variation in how likely you would be to recommend the company to friends and family it flows through your team, it flows through everything I was just talking about. It flows through your individual relationship with your individual team members and team leader. And so, Yes, undoubtedly, an awful lot of the company's talent brand is mediated through, indeed created through, your individual team. But that leaves 49% of it unexplained. And when you dive into the 49% that's unexplained, what you bump into is people's experiences of HR. In a way that's really different from people's experiences of IT, or people's experiences of the finance department, or people's experiences of real the real estate department. Sometimes we forget in HR that every single thing we deal with in HR, from the most basic, like do I have the right dependents listed on my you know, employee HRIS system or something really complicated, like I need to take a leave of absence because my mental health is really suffering. And sort of everything in between is super fraught, is emotionally fraught. Everything we do in HR touches the human in human resources. I mean, it touches at our very emotional core and we get stressed. Everything about the HR function and what the HR function deals with is stressful for the individual employee. And the way in which the HR function approaches that stress from the simplest things like uh, what kind of details we have about who I am, whether I'm married, where I live, what my zip code is, all the way to these really complicated issues that might relate to my mental health. Everything we do across that spectrum has got to be emotionally intelligent, emotionally responsive. And if we do that well, which is what this HRXPS metric turned out to be, if we do that well, we find that your likelihood to recommend the company to friends and family goes through the roof. That, that everything that HR does to be responsive and attentive to you becomes for you the company's talent brand. 
not necessarily replacing how important the manager is, but right alongside the manager is the HR function doing its thing. And when HR does its thing really, really attentively and really emotionally intelligently, people are far more measurably, far more likely to advocate the company as opposed to work to friends and family. By the way, they're also far less likely to be interviewing in another job to leave. And because we've measured this over time, if we ask the HR XPS metric at time one, three months later, if you have a positive experience with HR, you are much less likely to have actually left. So it's talent brand, it's intent to leave, and it's actually did you leave, all of those things are driven to some great extent by the experience of your HR function, which I think many of us in the HR function sort of believed we were doing important work. But weirdly, Lars, this was like the first time we dimensionalized that feeling. And I think hopefully it will be a call to arms for all of us in HR to go, all right, well, we have, in a sense, huge influence in whether or not our company will be able to thrive, both today and tomorrow, huge influence. Are we using that influence as wisely as we possibly can? That's kind of the intent around doing this metric so that we can kind of step into our own, I'll use the word power, step into our own power as a function to build or help a company build a talent brand deserving of the best. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And for those of you that uh, have not seen the report, I will include a link to it in the uh, the show notes. So you can check it out. I definitely encourage you to read the full report uh, and learn more because there's a lot of really interesting information there uh, and data as well. And um, speaking of data, you know, one of the data points that uh, candidly surprised me a little bit was uh, as you looked at high-performing HR teams uh, and some of the factors that made them up, um, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, that the, uh, the, the sweet spot, actually the, the increase of interactions with the HR team had a positive correlation um, with employees, uh, you know, overall uh, uh, views of the talent brand of the organization and of the, of the HR team. I think seven interactions was, was perhaps the, sweet, the optimal kind of sweet spot. Was there any uh, uh, subtext to those interactions that maybe define the nature of those interactions? Because that, uh, in, in an environment where we're, you know, we're, we're saying lots of employees, uh, you know, they don't want to necessarily interact with HR. And obviously you have a lot of organizations that have those legacy perceptions of HR in terms of personnel and or how they operate in a more transactional way. I, I'd love to get insights from you uh, and the research when, when you looked at those, uh, the nature of those kind of seven engagements, did you find any kind of commonalities there? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, so to begin with, obviously, the first thing that we were looking at is, does people's experience of HR drive anything relevant to the business? And of course, as we just described, it drives things like talent brand, it drives things like whether you actually leave, really important things. Once you sort of found that, then you go to the other, other end of the continuum almost, and you're going, well, then what drives, what drives a quality experience with HR? What are, the, uh, what are the key levers that can drive people saying, you know what, I had a really quality HR experience? Um, when we drove, dove into that, the, the two biggest things that emerged were two big surprises. One of them is what you just mentioned, which is the frequency of interaction with HR led to higher increases in your HR XPS and therefore higher and more positive reports of your talent brand and all sorts of good outcomes. So we initially started off by going, well, which of the interactions are important? Is it onboarding or is it a performance management or is it compensation or is it an employee relations issue that was resolved? Was it the quality of that interaction that was important? We asked all those questions and when you slice and dice it, it turned, it turned out that, that none of them individually was as important as the frequency that in fact, what people really, whether we have done this very well in the past or not, isn't the issue. People want to have frequent light touch interactions with HR because they need their emotional hand held, particularly during times like this. But, but more generally, a, across time, people want to feel like I'm doing the right thing for my family, I'm doing the right thing for my dependents, I'm doing the right thing in terms of my next promotion. I'm, and the person who, or people who help you be reassured that you're doing the right thing is very, very often the HR function. So frequency of interaction becomes 
one of the things that an HR function has got to think through really carefully because at the moment, yeah. the mega trends in HR are disintermediate, like to take HR out of the equation. It's employee self-serve. It's almost like the subtext is everyone hates HR. So sure, let's get rid of HR and then you can do it yourself. And then we'll build all these tech products that help you do it yourself. Because of course, dear employee, you want to do it yourself, don't you? And and deep down, I think what this reveals is that there's some logical fallacies there. If you do something really, really badly, then, then maybe you do want to kind of remove it. But HR done well is emotionally intelligent responsiveness. That's what it is, done well. And so if you do it well, then doing it well frequently is better than doing it well not frequently. And, and if you do that well frequently, what a cruise, what a cruise in the heart and the mind of the employee is, my company is like this. HR can be the kind of driving force of when a person describes what was that company really like to work for? HR turns out to be, and I'll, I mean, 49% HR, 51% your manager. I mean, that's, that's really close to the actual data that came out of this study. So what it, what it suggests is that we need to take ourselves in HR really, really seriously. We are not a problem, a friction point, an inefficient friction point to be removed. Sometimes we are, in which case, rather than just removing ourselves from the equation, we ought to be thinking about, well, how do we remove the friction? How do we move the inefficiency? How do we make that whole experience for that employee authentic, emotionally intelligent? responsive, individualized, relevant. How do we do that? Because if we do that, we'll have a better talent brand. Like it's, that's a very clear causal relation. If we do that well, we will deserve and find and get and keep better people. So it's like, dear CFO, if you don't want us to deserve the best people, if you don't want us able to keep good people, then don't invest in HR. But if you want to do it right, and actually build an organization deserving of the best people, you've got to invest in HR. And we've got to kind of rethink our own practice through the lens of us doing it really well. Because if we do it really well, then it becomes this really powerful aspect of the employee experience at work. So that was a, a huge discovery for us. And the second one that was sort of a corollary to it is single point of contact. Because when people said, I have a single point of HR contact, they were far more likely to advocate the company to friends and family, which again is weird because we are moving into a more siloed HR world, aren't we? Where you've got lots of centers of excellence, but no one person that knows you. And if you're kind of in the middle ranks of a company, there really is no one to call who's, who knows you, the team you're on, when you joined, your personal situation. It's like, if you've got a problem about insurance, you call th this company call center over here. If you've got a problem about your pay and your withholding, you go over here. If you've got a problem about a training program, you go over here, which is okay to have these centers of excellence as, as destinations. But what our research seemed to show is you don't want to go straight there. You want a quarterback. You want kind of an HR quarterback who knows you and can listen to whatever it is that's going to come out of your mouth before they send you off to these centers of excellence. It's a bit like in healthcare, when you go into the hospital, you want somebody who knows your whole body before they send you off to get your gallbladder removed. You're, you're not the gallbladder in room 203. You're a human, you're a whole human and you want a whole human. So hospitals have come up with this new role called the hospitalist, who's a doctor, who's just there to kind of explain what's going on to all the other doctors. Well, in a sense, we want that from our HR function. I don't exactly know how we deliver that in a cost-effective way, but for humans to feel as though they have to be their own expert in the whole panoply of HR areas is super stressful. And so HR's got to, we've got to emotionally empathize with that and then build org structures and technology. I'm not suggesting technology shouldn't have a huge part to play in this, it should but you still got a human on the other end of it going, help, I, I, I don't know, I think I'm doing it wrong. I'm probably doing it wrong. What, what's right? And we need someone that we can call and talk to before we get thrown off into these call centers over here or chat bots over there. Yeah, I mean, I, you raised 
So many great points there. And I think when you look at, uh, you know, the conversation and the trend around automation, you know, it seems to run counter to what your data is actually presenting in terms of what employees need and want and, and, and how they can be supported. And I think particularly in this environment, uh, the market for HR is unlike anything uh, I've seen in over 20 years. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think part of that is companies who didn't have the kinds of HR teams that you're describing, um, that was very exposed during the pandemic and everything that we've been through over the last you know, two years. It's not just the pandemic. Uh, and so those companies are now saying, well, wait a minute, we have to think differently about how we're investing in our people function and, and, and the leadership and the teams and the resources and the tools. Um, but also the team is because I think that it is essential for organizations to be able to make those investments. And the investment doesn't just come with hiring a new chief people officer and expecting them to fix everything. They've got to be resourced in a way that will allow them to create a, a tailored and impactful strategy and roadmap uh, for the people function, you know, beyond just kind of transacting. And so I think that those are you know, the, the trends that we're seeing on the hiring side are are aligned, aligning, I think, with what you're seeing on the data in terms of companies really investing more um, on the people teams. And, you know, one other question about the report, you, you kind of broke down some of the, um, you know, kind of common traits. So for companies that, that did a grade very high on their HR XPS score, were there certain um, common uh, things that they were doing uh, consistently across regions. I know this was a global report. So what were things that they tended to do that, that you know, maybe correlated with a higher score? So for those of you that are watching and viewing and kind of looking at some ideas that you can bring to your organization, um, I, I'd love to see kind of what your learnings were on that, uh, Marcus. Yeah, so to begin with, um, you know, we can go back to the beginning. And if you are part of the HR organization, um, just thinking about what is your fundamental mission and purpose is a jolly important thing to do. Uh, what are we here to do? And and deep down, we are here to ensure that we've built the sort of workplace that deserves the very best. The, I mean, and if we can really just orient ourselves around that, are we doing things that help people feel like we deserve the best? You're not going to go too far wrong. Secondly, single point of contact, as I mentioned, can your HR function figure out a way that's cost effective to make most people in the organization feel as though they do know there is someone they can call who knows them? Um, it's so reassuring and confidence inducing during these crazy times. Third, onboarding. Um, of all the things that HR does, having spent so much energy doing the talent acquisition part of things, can you bring me on? And of course, when you really push on onboarding, and again, we've tried to automate the living daylights out of this, haven't we? But the most important part of onboarding is team joining. It's can you make me very quickly feel like I'm part of this team here? Well, many HR functions don't even have any part of it that's team joining. It's has the company explained its mission properly? Has the company given you its IT, you know, its tech, its badges and its computers properly? And has which is good, but the most important part of onboarding is making sure that a person feels that they are very quickly connected to a small group of people who they now know and can be supported by. And if you get that right, you get team joining right, um, you will see much uh, less 90-day voluntary turnover. It's just the way humans work is we 85% of all humans around the world say they do most of their work on teams. Well, then that would suggest that the HR function should make team joining the very first thing that we get right. The, the fourth thing I would say is, is frequency of performance attention. Um, we do, and there's been a lot of discussion over this over the last four or five years, but we're clearly moving away from the once a year performance review, which we should. Um, humans want frequent light touch attention about the near-term future. How frequent? Every week. I mean, that's what we've learned through the pandemic is that the way you stay connected with a human is that, is, is that you frequently talk about the near-term future with that human. It could be on the phone, it could be by text. When we've studied this, it turns out, Lars, that then the, the, the modality doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't seem to matter whether you're doing it in person or whether you're doing it via text. What's important is that every week, somebody's saying to you, what are your priorities for the coming week and how can I help? What are your priorities, how can I help? 
if I get the feeling that every week I'm going to have that individual, not as a team, I don't need to do it as a team, I need to do it one-on-one -on -one with my team leader, but if I'm doing it one-on-one -on -one with my team leader and it's about short-term future, what are my priorities, how can the team leader help, boy, I feel seen. I feel seen in sort of a regular 52-week cadence for the year. There's a lot of talk about different technologies we should be using to stay connected with one another. But boy, if you've got a phone, if you've got a text, whatever, that every week, it's just me looking to you and saying, what's up this coming week? Ah, okay, how about this? Try this, tweak that, blah, blah, blah. Anything more I can do to help? Okay, but not every single week is gonna be an amazing coaching moment. I'm not suggesting that. I'm flipping it around. The employee, need, we are all so, we. We get so lonely, and I don't mean even pre-pandemic, you just feel unseen. And so if HR, if we get frequent performance attention right, and I think we've got it really, really wrong in many places, we've massively overcomplicated it, we've connected it to ratings, which have been connected to succession planning, which is connected to at-risk compensation, we made the whole thing far too complicated, with the result that the poor managers are going, I don't want to do that frequently. I want to do that really infrequently because it's really complicated. And we've, <laughs> we've, we've missed the idea that what the employee needs is a frequent light touch interaction because then they feel seen. If, if HR can figure out how do we do that well? How do we do frequent light touch attention well? How do we train managers to do it? How do we give them the tech to do it? How do we give them the training to do it? Then we'll keep more people. And we'll make more people feel seen and we'll get less people feeling lonely. And that doesn't mean, sorry, last thought on this, but that doesn't mean we're checking up on people. And there's a lot of these sort of almost spyware apps, as I'm sure you've seen, where managers can check on exactly. Okay, it's like if there's one thing that HR should take away from this report, it's that the most valuable asset of a company isn't its people. The most valuable asset of a company is its trust. How much trust do you have? Anything you're doing that brings trust in will enable you to serve more of the best people. So frequent light touch attention is just a way to bring trust in because I now know what you, my manager, want for the next week and what I want and we've got connected and we're gonna connect again and we're gonna connect again and that will bring more trust in. Team joining, as I mentioned, is a way to establish trust quickly on a team. Um, single point of contact. Oh, there's one person I can call who I trust. So all of these things are trust inducing. Anything that HR is doing, and sometimes we have to do things that reduce trust, but anything that HR does that reduces trust, like checking up on people's, I don't know, use of hours on their computer or whatever, anything you do to reduce trust reduces the value of your organization. So <clears throat> HR should be the advocate for any practices that increase the overall level of trust in the organization. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you touched on the uh, employee monitoring software as well. Like, just don't do that, period. Don't do that. Don't, don't, if you're in an organization that has that software, if you're an organization that is, uh, you know, exploring that and you're in HR and you can stand up against that, do that because nothing's going to erode trust faster uh, than feeling like I, I'm, you know, I'm under surveillance essentially because it's basically that's what that, you know, that category of software is so um yeah no I, works, I couldn't agree more with uh, yeah, that i couldn't agree more i'd love to get your perspective you know uh, uh you know I, th I think we we share an optimistic view around uh kind of where the world of work is heading and obviously you've been kind of deeply researching this field for for decades when you think about what's next um and I, you know at this point I, you know, we're kind of pandemic, endemic. I, you know, we almost have to say kind of living in the environment we're living in today and moving forward and what that looks like, it looks like. What gets you most excited uh, about the, the, the future for the field as it relates to kind of work broadly or HR specifically? Well, the, I think during times of great pressure, like we're in now, it causes us to reassess a lot of our fundamental principles. So you were just talking about surveillance software. You can go into most distribution centers today and you can find the equivalent of surveillance software where work monitoring systems can see how many hours off task you were or minutes off task you were. And if you're off task for a certain number of minutes, two days in a row, you're fired. I mean, the, the, and this isn't, 
you know, some 1984 Orwellian view, right? This is, this is happening today, right now. You've got examples, I'm sure, at the top of your head, so, so, so do I. And times like this force us to stop and question, why are we doing that? Why are we surveilling? Why are we mistrusting so much? What are our fundamental beliefs about human beings? Do we deeply down, deep down, do we deeply believe that they are lazy, that they're basically trying to figure out how little they can do, what, how much they can get away with? Is, is that our fundamental belief? Times like this force us to question our fundamental beliefs. I am really optimistic that what will come out of this, frankly, and it's the tightest labor market in, well, certainly here in the US since the late 60s, um, what will come out of it, the companies that will win will be the ones that go, no, our fundamental belief about human beings is that they actually have capability, that they've all got something that they can bring to us, and that they want accountability. If we create the right context, people want to be responsible for something. They want to contribute. And if you can, if you can be an HR function that, that facilitates the the reassessing of our fundamental beliefs about humans, then all sorts of really cool programs and practices and technologies will flow from that. I actually think, and this this is, you know, you asked a question right at the beginning about what else I've been thinking about and working on. Um, I've been working with uh, my publisher, HBR, with, for a, a new book that's going to come out about love. about And it's called Love, love and Work. And... <laughs> The idea here is that work is such a beautiful place in which you get to discover that which you love. Not that you have to do all that you love. There's very little data actually, Lars, that show that the best people love all that they do. So kind of to say, yeah. do what you love is a little like, ugh, really? The, the data seems to suggest that 20, 25% is a really good threshold. If every single day, there are certain activities or moments or contexts that you love, you will contribute more, you will be more resilient, you will be more persistent, you will be more likely to collaborate with others. All sorts of good things happen when you feel that, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a salesperson, whatever your job is. So I kind of love the idea. We've built, let's face it, loveless classrooms where who you are on the inside is sort of irrelevant to all of the, the instruction that we're trying to give you and the standardized testing we're trying to give you. And we've kind of built loveless workplaces where there's a lot of conformity. We're trying to say basically who you are on the inside is kind of irrelevant <laughs> to all of the competencies and attributes we're going to try to inject into you and then measure you on. So I rather like the idea that where we are right now is going to cause us to think about how do we bring more love into the workplace? How do we take your own loves seriously? If someone as eminent of Steve Jobs can do in that famous Stanford commencement address, if he can say you will never be great at something if you don't love it, which seems a bit simplistic, but there's if someone as good as him can go, I'm sorry, love really matters, then why haven't we taken it seriously in, in the world of work? Today, if you don't really take seriously what people love about what they do, if you're not interested in that, if you basically design jobs as though they're loveless, as though most people will hate them, as though we have to check up on people doing them, if you design jobs that way, they'll probably end up as loveless jobs, which if the labor market was really fat, it wouldn't really matter, I suppose. But it isn't. It's really tight. So what that means, I think, is an opportunity for the best companies to say, you know what? We are going to take what our people uniquely love, we'll take it seriously, and we'll try to build selection systems, performance management systems, training programs that help each person discover and contribute. It's not just about narcissism, it's about contribution, contribute that which they love. And boy, if we, I, I realize I'm sort of taking a big subject and I'm <laughs> I'm just describing it in like two seconds. But if we took love seriously, we would deserve the best people. We haven't yet. HR hasn't yet. That's even kind of a squishy, squishy word that we're even a bit uncomfortable talking about. But if we could do that right, then work would be a really different place than it is today. At the moment, it seems to be something that we have to withstand, something to bear. And when we bear too much of it, we get burned out. And so work becomes the problem that we have to fix. But if we thought about it a little differently, we might think, you know what? 
we don't necessarily have to build um, meditation rooms next to the operating room or a yoga studio next to the ER so you can escape that horrible work thing. If we thought about work differently, what are the things about it that invigorate you? What are the things about it that you love? Could work actually be part of what lifts you up? Not to be too Pollyanna, but could we actually start thinking about jobs that way, about teaching jobs that way, about nursing jobs that way, about, about housekeeping jobs that way? What bits of it do you love and how can we figure out how you can get that out of the work that you do every day? That's not not real. I spent, as you know, my first 17 years with Gallup studying people that were highly successful in their jobs. One of them was housekeepers. You study the best housekeepers, they love a lot of what they do. But they, weirdly enough, a lot of the job descriptions actually prevented them from doing a lot of what they love to do. So we sort of design jobs as though they're rotten. <laughs> and then we wonder why people think they're rotten. So I think a time like this is an opportunity to reassess what work can be for us in our lives. And we haven't really peeled the onion on that very much at all. I'm optimistic about that peeling and what we can find there. Yeah. Well, Marcus, I, I, I love that closing thought uh, and I share that optimism. And I think that we're in this period of, of reinvention of work itself. It's not even just HR. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see all of the, the potential and new practices and the impact of those practices uh, on not just the field of HR, but our workforce uh, globally. So thanks so much for coming on the show, uh, sharing your career story, uh, helping us learn about HR XPS. Um, I will have a link to that in the show notes. Um, so if you're watching or viewing and you haven't seen that yet, definitely check that out. And uh, in the meantime, thanks so much for, for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. Not at all. Thank you for having me, Lars. Appreciate it.